on afterwards. And now a hearing on financial scams targeting senior citizens involving purported sweepstakes winnings, robocalls to maximize a number of potential victims, and so-called grandparent scams. The Senate Aging Committee event is just under an hour, 50 minutes. Good afternoon. That was to wake all of you up. <laughs> I'm pleased to welcome both new and returning members to the committee. And I'm delighted that my good friend, Senator Casey, will be serving as the committee's new ranking member during this Congress. I want to specifically welcome Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, uh, from the great state of Nevada uh, to the committee. We look forward to having you join our work. And of course, it's wonderful to welcome back Senator Gillibrand, who's been so committed to this issue, the issues that we have explored as well. Speaking of Senator Gillibrand, I understand that her son Theo is here today. He is doing a special a class project, so he got an excused absence to be at our hearing today uh, for the project that he is doing. And I know that's going to be a very interesting project. My apologies also that this hearing had to be delayed from when it was first scheduled on February 1st due to a long series of votes on the Senate floor. During this Congress, this committee will continue its focus on three major issues. First, retirement security. We want to make sure that our seniors have sufficient resources so that they don't outlive their savings or find that their golden years end in poverty. Second, biomedical research investments for diseases like Alzheimer's and diabetes that disproportionately affect our seniors. And third, financial schemes and other scams targeting older Americans, and that is the subject of today's hearing. Last summer, an 81-year-old constituent came into my office in Portland, Maine, with an alarming story of deception and cruelty. A con artist claiming to be an IRS agent had just cheated him out of $8,000, and he narrowly avoided losing $15,000 more. After reporting the crime to the local police, my constituent, Philip Hatch, and his son came into my office. My staff gave him a copy of the fraud book that this committee produced last year, as well as a special postcard that we created with tips on how to avoid scams. Mr. Hatch told us that the tactics described in the materials provided were exactly those that were used by the scammer. If only he had received that information sooner, he might have recognized the scam and avoided losing his hard-earned savings. Mr. Hatch was very willing to testify today and to share his story, but health issues prevent him from traveling. Instead, he graciously and courageously provided a video in order to share his experience. And we'll see that video in a moment. This episode demonstrates two important points. First, the criminals who prey on our seniors are relentless. 
They will harass seniors over and over again until they have drained every penny from their life savings. Second, this committee's longstanding dedication to fighting fraud against seniors is raising awareness and prompting enforcement actions that are making a real difference. We must redouble our efforts to educate seniors, their families, and their caregivers. The stakes are extremely high. According to the Government Accountability Office, America's seniors lose a staggering $2.9 billion each year to an ever-growing array of financial exploitation schemes and scams. Today's hearing coincides with the release of our committee's 2017 fraud book. Like the book that we published last year, it lists the top 10 scams being perpetrated against seniors, along with information on how to recognize, avoid, and report them. In both years, the IRS impersonation scam was the leading offender. These lists reflect the calls made to our committee's toll-free hotline. In 2015, hotline staff fielded more than 1,100 calls. L last year, the hotline's call volume doubled to more than 2,200 calls. It's clear that our efforts are raising public awareness, and more important, our efforts are producing real results. I look forward this morning to the testimony of the Treasury Inspector General's Office on recent evolutions in the IRS imposter scam, such as the demand for payment in iTunes gift cards to which Mr. Hatch and many others have fallen victim. Raising awareness about the IRS scam is particularly timely as we are in the midst of tax filing season. Last May, thanks to the work of our hotline investigators, the IG arrested five individuals in connection with the IRS imposter scam. Federal authorities believe that these suspects stole almost $3 million from more than 1,200 victims. In October, 56 individuals and five call centers in India were indicted in another important case. In addition to producing criminal charges, these efforts are making it more difficult for criminals to find victims. I also look forward to hearing from the Federal Trade Commission on other scams that are targeting our seniors, such as those involving grants, counterfeit checks, and romance schemes, which are particularly timely with yesterday being Valentine's Day. As our 2017 fraud book makes clear, while we are certainly making progress, far too many victims are still losing money and often their retirement savings. Law enforcement, consumer advocates, area agencies on aging, AARP, and financial institutions play vital roles, but alert citizens are still our first and best line of defense. I'm proud of our committee's work on this crucial issue to help seniors become more aware and more informed and to put criminals on notice that they will be stopped and brought to justice. I'm now very pleased to turn to our new ranking member, Senator Casey, for his opening statement. Chairman Collins, thank you very much for your leadership and for convening this hearing the first hearing of the Committee on Aging, the Special Committee on Aging, for the 115th Congress to discuss senior scams, as she just outlined. Also, I want to thank her for 
working with me to address issues impacting older Americans even before the start of this Congress. I would also like to welcome uh, new members of the committee. I know right now we have uh, Senator Cortez Masto here. We're, we're grateful that she's with us. And of course, Senator Gillibrand, uh, who's been with the committee for a number of years. We're grateful for that help, especially on these critically important issues for our families. The Aging Committee has historically been a committee that fosters both collaboration and bipartisanship on issues facing older Americans. And that was, again, abundantly clear by the voice vote we held off of the Senate floor two weeks ago to approve the uh, committee budget and the committee rules. And uh, I think I was late for that hearing, but... <laughs> I somehow, wasn't going to mention Somehow that. my voice got recorded. <laughs> but I want to thank the chairman for that. It's my sincere hope that that will continue, and I'm sure that it will. The future of key programs for older Americans like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and others are also critically important to the agenda of, of uh, this committee. We have a, a responsibility, I believe, to protect these vital programs for older Americans. Today we have the opportunity to hear from experts uh, who will give us testimony on the challenging issue of combating fraud and scams, which of course target older Americans and affect uh, older Americans as well as their families. Experts testifying today include Diane Menio from Pennsylvania, the, w from a, a, a senior advocacy, advocacy organization that I've worked with over many years, CARI, and um, we'll, I'll talk more about Diane in a moment. But I want to thank her and her organization's work for what you've done for years to help uh, those who are potential victims of these kinds of scams. Also pleased to, be, to have joined Senator Collins in releasing a committee report detailing the top 10 scams targeting our nation's seniors that you saw a moment ago. The report is based upon the experiences of more than 2,200 individuals who contacted the committee's fraud hotline over the past year. It will inform the work of this committee going forward. I was also happy to join with the chairman in re re reintroducing the Senior SAFE Act last week. This important legislation both encourages financial institutions to disclose suspected exploitation of seniors when they see it and protects them from being sued for making these reports if they have an, uh, an appropriately trained, if they have, I should say, appropriately trained their staff and made good faith reports. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, more than one in six seniors, uh, or one in six residents is 65 years and older. In 2015, 22,000 cases of suspected elder abuse and neglect were reported by the Pennsylvania Department of Aging's Protective Services Program. That's why last spring I held a field hearing in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania to hear directly from constituents, both those affected by scams and those trying to prevent these scams. Just by way of example, a constituent from uh, Kingston Township told the heartbreaking story of a scam artist uh, attempting to steal the identity and use the credit cards of her husband of 43 years after, after his death. The Luzerne County District Attorney highlighted the most common type of scam happening today, at least in that area, the sweepstakes or lottery scam. Victims are promised lottery winnings if they uh, just pay often sizable so-called taxes and fees up front. The District Attorney recalled one older victim being scammed out of $85,000 in the hope of retrieving $1 million in fake lottery winnings. While experts struggle to estimate the total financial impact of scam, uh, scams targeting seniors, mainly because it's so underreported, they know that it adds up to nearly $3 billion a year in lost savings and potentially billions more. It isn't just money that's lost in these scams, it's older American sense of security and financial independence. It's outrageous for people who have worked, uh, ver worked very hard all their lives and are being targeted for their uh, nest eggs when they are at their most vulnerable. And it's wrong that seniors still feel afraid to report these schemes. They should not be embarrassed or ashamed. They should know that we have their backs and we're here to help them fight back. That's why uh, enforcement is such a critical part of this discussion. While it may not be easy to track down these increasingly sophisticated scammers and their domestic 
and international networks and hold them accountable, we must do so for the safety and security of our parents and grandparents. Recently, Senator Collins and I applauded the Federal Trade Commission and Justice Department settlement with Western Union, in which the company admitted uh, to criminal anti-money uh, laundering violations that have disproportionately affected aging Americans. This settlement, $586 million in the settlement, will be used to compensate victims of fraud where Western Union agents were complicit in the scams. But there's more work to do. We'll continue to use the spotlight of this committee to both uh, help consumers understand the threat and to highlight the need for action. It is for this reason I'll continue to fight to ensure that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has the resources that it needs. The CFPB houses the only federal office solely focused on sharing financial information with seniors and educating seniors about how to prevent becoming the victim of fraud. Until recently, th this office was was led by former Pennsylvania Secretary of Aging, Nora Dowd, uh, Nora Dowd Eisenhower, is in the first row uh, at our hearing today. We also need to help keep up the, up the fight to ensure that the Affordable Care Act fraud and abuse provisions uh, are in place. Uh, we know that the government has realized a record-breaking $10.7 billion in recovery of health care fraud in the last three years, increasing, uh, having new tools that increased federal sentencing guidelines for health care fraud uh, and on and on from there. We also know that proposals that I will oppose, like black granting Medicaid, could present states with real challenges when it comes to addressing waste, fraud, uh, and abuse in, in programs. Finally, in order to make, uh, in order to continue the good work, I should say, of the, the witnesses here today, as, as well as others, and to support our colleagues at the, uh, in, in other parts of the government, Social Security Administration and other departments, in maintaining a skilled workforce, I'm seriously concerned about the impact of the federal hiring freeze and how that will affect middle class families. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and again want to thank our chairman for gathering us today on this important topic. Thank you very much, Senator Casey. I want to welcome another new member of our committee, Senator Marco Rubio. Uh, Senator Rubio represents the state with the highest percentage of senior uh, citizens. I represent the state with the oldest median age. That's because a lot of my seniors go to Florida. And, so they tend to spend exactly six months and one day there. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I have a feeling it has to do with taxes. Uh, but it, <laughs> it is uh, great to have you as a member of the committee. And I want to welcome back Senator Warren, uh, who was here briefly and I'm sure will be returning as well. We'll now turn to our panel of witnesses. First, we're going to view a brief video from Mr. Philip Hatch. He is from Portland, Maine, and he'll share his personal experience dealing with the IRS impersonators that I mentioned in my opening statement. Next, we'll hear from Tim Camus. He is the Deputy Inspector General for Investigations at the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Inspector General for Tax Administration. That may be one of the longest titles of any witness that we ever have, uh, but his office has done extraordinary work, and I want to thank him. Uh, next, we will welcome back to the committee Lois Griesman, who is the Associate Director of the Division of Marketing Practices at the Bureau of Consumer protection at the Federal Trade Commission, better known as the FTC, and um, Senator Casey has already introduced our final witness for the day, Diane McNeil, and we're very happy to have her here too. McNeil, did I get it right that time? Thank you. I want to thank you all for joining us, and we'll now start with the video. My name is Philip Hatch. Uh, I'm 81 years old and I'm from Portland, Maine, born and raised. I received a telephone call. I answered the phone and the man said he was a representative from the Internal Revenue Service. I said, what can I do to help you? 
He says, well, we've gone through the records and there's been a mistake here on your, on your returns and you owe us uh, $5,988 and some odd cents. So I said, fine. Tell me who I make the check out to and where do I mail it? He says, well, we can't do that. We have a warrant out for your arrest and the marshals will be in your house within an hour. And I said, well, what would you like me to do to help resolve this? They said, you can go to CVS and get those iTunes cards, and just when you come back, uh, you can read the numbers off to us. So the other guy said, that doesn't sound like a very professional way to do it. He said, well, it's either that or the, the marshal's coming, and, we, and we, if, we can, if we can do this, we can tell them not to come. So I did. I went and got these little iTunes cards, came back, read the numbers off them, and, and they said, okay, now, you can't tell anybody about this. I said, what do you mean I can't tell anybody about this? I'm going to tell my guy that makes up my tax returns. I'm a little mad at him. You know, he said made a mistake. They said, well, no, don't do that. Everything will be taken care of. This started at 4 in the afternoon and went on till 8 o'clock at night. Uh, they called me the next day, and they said there was a mistake. I said, what do you mean a mistake? It wasn't five thousand nine hundred something dollars was twenty three thousand dollars they had somebody call me on the regular phone i'm still on my cell phone and say that he was a portland police officer and that they had a local warrant for my arrest so i put my son on the phone and he goes who's this and they said well who's this and he goes he gave him a phony name and said he was an fbi agent and they said whoops <laughs> and they hung up and that was the end of it. But I had already sent in $8,000 to these people. Being in the military and being working for the government, and, you know, the government calls up and you say, aye, aye, sir, what do you need? Can I help you? Okay. And maybe if I hadn't had that background, I wouldn't have been so cooperative. But I, got, I was mad, upset that I was taken in. Just give me five minutes in a room alone with those people and I'd be happy. All I can say is just be wary, you know. You know, just be careful, and uh, when it comes to someone going after your money, uh, just say, listen, I'll, I'll think about it over tonight, and you can get back to me tomorrow, and then contact someone and find out. That's the best advice I could do. As you can see, this is really outrageous, and illustrates the lengths to which these criminals will go. And a lot of times they do target people who are either isolated or have been in the military. We did a whole hearing on scams that are directed at those who have been in, in the military. And they will stop at nothing. They kept Mr. Hatch on the phone for four hours from four p.m. to 8 p.m., getting him to go from place to ba place to buy the iTunes card, which is a new variation that we're seeing on the IRS imposter scam. And it frightens people when they get a call from someone claiming to be from the IRS. It frightens all of us to get that kind of call. And it's become so sophisticated that these con artists can spoof the number so it looks like if they have caller ID, it'll say U.S. Treasury. Mm -hmm. So that makes them think that it is for real. And it just shows that they will stop at nothing. I'd now uh, like to call on our, our first witness who is actually here with us, um, Mr. Kamis, for his testimony. Thank you, Senator. Chairman Collins, Ranking Member Casey, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the topic of financial frauds affecting seniors. Over the past three years, TIGDA has conducted numerous investigations on the issue of IRS-related frauds and scams, telephone impersonation scams, sweepstakes or lottery scams, and email and phishing scams are among the top 10 fraud schemes used by criminals to target senior citizens. I will highlight two major IRS-related scams we have been investigating. The first is a telephone impersonation scam in which more than 1.8 million Americans reported to us that they've received unsolicited telephone calls 
from individuals falsely claiming to be IRS employees. The second is the so-called sweepstakes or lottery scam, which has reemerged as a significant threat to the integrity of tax administration. The telephone impersonation scam continues to be one of TIGDA's top priorities. No one is immune from receiving these calls. I receive calls myself. TIGDA has made numerous arrests in connection with this scam, and we have a number of significant investigations that are still underway. For example, this committee made a direct referral to TIGDA involving a senior citizen located in Florida who was so frightened by the impersonators that following their directions, he immediately drove to his local Walmart while remaining on the phone with them. During the drive, he crashed his vehicle and continued on foot in order to obtain a money grant payment as demanded by the impersonators. TIGDA special agents worked diligently on this referral and ultimately identified five suspects in Miami, Florida. These suspects were arrested by TIGDA special agents for wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. In October 2016, after an extensive three-year joint investigation, the Department of Justice obtained an indictment on 56 individuals, 24 of whom were located in the United States, and five call centers located in India. The investigation identified approximately $272 million of total fraud and thousands of victims involving multiple fraud schemes. This is the largest single law enforcement action to date involving the IRS impersonation scam, and the operation's success is a result of excellent cross-agency collaboration and the efforts of hundreds of TIGDA employees who participated in this investigation. In addition, TIGDA has taken numerous other steps to fight this crime. For example, we created a strategy designed to shut down the impersonator's callback numbers. We've also developed an outstanding working relationship with the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission to combat this scam. We have worked with the AARP and the Veterans Administration on public warning messages. TIGDA has also employed a public awareness campaign. We recorded five videos that received over 71,000 views, and we've provided approximately 100 print and media interviews, resulting in over 4,400 news stories in both large and small media markets, resulting in an estimated 113 million views. We also worked with the private sector, such as Walmart and Apple, who were used in this massive fraud. These companies are now helping us to warn consumers about the scam. As a result of all of these efforts, the impersonation scam's impact on the public has been significantly reduced. Today, there are 92% fewer reported calls each week and 93% fewer victims reported to us that they paid the scammers money. However, the problem has not gone away entirely and the volume is starting to come back. For example, we received on average 1,000 reported calls per week in early January and our data for last week shows we received over 4,600 calls for the week. I believe sustained investigative efforts and ongoing outreach to ensure people do not become victims in the first place is critical to our success in fighting this scam. Another fraud scheme, the lottery scam, has continued to target and victimize senior citizens. Its premise is simple. The scammers contact victims to advise them that they have won a lottery or sweepstakes but first, they need to pay a non-existent federal tax or fee in order to receive the prize. Over the last few years, TIGDA has conducted investigations that have identified over 30 individuals who are responsible for defrauding victims out of millions of dollars. We have obtained some prosecutions, and we're working on others to address this crime. In summary, we at TIGDA take seriously our mandate to protect American taxpayers and the integrity of the Internal Revenue Service. As such, we plan to continuing investigative coverage in this area, and we look forward to our continued collaboration and discussions on ways we can fight these types of frauds and scams in the future. Chairman Collins, Ranking Member Casey, and members of the committee, thank you so much for your support and for the opportunity to share my views. Thank you, Chairman Collins, Ranking Member Casey, and members of the committee. I am very happy to appear before you again 
to discuss the FTC's broad efforts to protect seniors against frauds, which is a critical part of its consumer protection mission. These efforts are driven through the FTC's law enforcement work, its coordination with U.S. and international partners, and with a tremendous emphasis, its education and outreach initiatives. First, just a quick overview. As you know, the population of older Americans is growing rapidly. By 2013, more than one-fifth of U.S. residents will be over age 65. Now, throughout our law enforcement work, we train a deliberate eye on whether fraudsters are targeting specific consumer populations, and in particular, whether they're targeting seniors. We do see that certain types of fraud, such as Medicare imposter scams, deceptive pitches for medical alert devices, brain training programs to treat cognitive uh, impairments, such as Alzheimer's, or supplements to address or eliminate joint pain, all may well be directed specifically to seniors. In other areas, such as the technical support scam, where scammers impersonate, for example, Dell or Microsoft, and lead you to believe that your computer is in dire straits and that only they have the remedy to fix it, we do think seniors may be disproportionately impacted. And with TIGDA, and as Deputy Inspector Camus has just indicated, we have strong partners in our work, and, and particularly on the, in, in combating the IRS imposter scam. But as a practical matter, scammers care little about their victim's age. As a result, we see seniors impacted across the entire spectrum of our consumer protection work, from investment and business opportunity frauds to bogus health care products to timeshare resales frauds. I want to take a moment to highlight, uh, as, as Ranking Member Casey referred to, the recent $586 million settlement with Western Union. A good many iterations of fraud flowed through Western Union's money transfer system. But we know, based on, on the investigation, that lottery scams, so-called emergency scams, such as the grandparent scam, and the online dating or romance scams were well represented among the complaints the company received. And we know that these types of scams often target and impact older consumers. In addition to the more than half billion dollar settlement, the FTC's order requires Western Union to impl implement a comprehensive anti-fraud program that, among other things, will require suspension or termination of problematic agents under certain requirements. And as you mentioned, the Department of Justice entered into a deferred prosecution uh, agreement with the company at the same time. Not only has the FTC proceeded against money transfers, this morning we announced a settlement with a Florida man and his company that allegedly helped telemarketers in India dupe consumers in the U.S. into paying hundreds or even thousands of dollars for taxes they did not owe. These telemarketers often, to, as we heard from Mr. Hatch, often pretended to be from the IRS or, or in this case from another government agency that had grant money to dole out and told consumers to pay via MoneyGram or Western Union. The defendants uh, with whom we settled were the U.S.-based entities that orchestrated having runners literally driving up and down the Florida coast to various retail stores to collect the money transfers before consumers realized they'd been scammed and could take some action. And as you know, law, FTC law enforcement regularly collaborates with our partners here, state and federal, as well as internationally. And for these purposes, I want to simply note that we and our colleagues have spent considerable time working with law enforcement and other stakeholders here and in India to curb illegal telemarketing hitting the U.S. Finally, we continue to improve upon and build out our Pass It On education effort. I'm sure you're familiar with this. I've sh we've shown it, shared it with you many times. Um, it's aimed at active adults, and this is our signature initiative. It reaches seniors in social, social clubs, libraries, senior centers, veterans facilities. And we recently added a new video about how an imposter scam harmed a retired teacher. We, post, we also recently posted another new video about the Pass It On campaign itself, highlighting how important it is for, for an older consumer to be the one who helps friends and families to avoid being excuse me, to avoid being victimized. We continue to use these resources and to promote them with our state and federal partners. In sum, through aggressive law enforcement, strategic policy initiatives, and innovative consumer education, we will continue to tackle scammers that exploit older consumers. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Menino. Good afternoon. Um, 
My name is Diane Menio, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Advocacy for the Rights and Interests of the Elderly. I just thought I'd say the full name thank so that you'd you know why we have a girl's name for a name. So um, thank you, Senator Casey, uh, Chairwoman Com Collins, and members of the committee for your interest in financial exploitation, fraud, and scams against the elderly, and for the opportunity to present testimony today. Two weeks ago, uh, Charlotte Kick Kittler from Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, a volunteer in our Pennsylvania Senior Medicare Patrol Program, accompanied me here to the hearing. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't make it today, but I know she's here in spirit. She was very excited to be in the, at the Senate at all, so she's, um, and she works very hard with us. Um, and so I'm, today I'm going to talk about health care fraud. I'm going to also talk about abuse, scams, and financial exploitation um, targeting the elderly and how CARI is working to protect seniors across the state of Pennsylvania. Founded in 1977, CARI is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the quality of life for frail older adults. CARI works to protect the roles, rights and of older adults and promote awareness of their special needs and concerns. In addition, we provide a range of services to help older victims of crime, abuse, and financial exploitation, including a program that helps elder victims through the court process and assists with victim impact statements and crime victims' compensation. In addition, CARI coordinates Pennsylvania's Senior Medicare Patrol program to help fight Medicare and Medicaid fraud. We have more than 75 retired Medicare beneficiaries who provide that peer education about health care fraud and share information about how to prevent being victimized. While we talk about the great toll that financial exploitation exacts on its victims, it is important to note that the problem of exploitation impacts many people, whether their net worth is in the millions, the thousands, or even the hundreds. Every day, Carry, carry peer volunteers like Charlotte, talk to individuals who have been victims of these horrendous crimes, and look for solutions to provide guidance to prevent scams from occurring in the first place. Additionally, we send out scam wire alerts that help to identify new threats to the aging community that seek to involve elders in fraud through mailings, email, community meetings, and phone calls. I'd like to share just a few stories about cases we hear every day. 71-year-old uh, um, Mary from Philadelphia was contacted by an individual representing himself as a spokesman for Publishers Clearinghouse. Mary was told that she had won several hundred thousand dollars but had to pay the taxes on the prize. She initially sent them two hundred dollars. Then she was contacted again and they told her that she misunderstood and she needed to send another two thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars in cash via the United States Postal Service. Mary finally thought better of what she did and filed a police report. She initially admitted to the first mailing, um, but then after talking to our victim advocate, revealed the second, the second um, amount that she sent. And she told us that she was very embarrassed, and that's why she hadn't reported, reported it right away, and that's why she was only willing to talk about the $200 at first, because she felt that that wasn't so bad. Um, but, but the extra money made her very embarrassed. So she did, after talking to our, our victim advocate, um, talk to the police about that, that gave them the information that she was given the address and the phone number of the person that had called her, but of course they couldn't find that person anymore. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't get the money back from the Crime Victims um, Assistance Fund um, because there's a time limit involved with that. Um, we just really need to offer some of these people more security and more ability to resist these crimes. Um, Gloria, who was 88 and from Delaware County in Pennsylvania, received a phone call from a person claiming to be her grandson. When she questioned why he didn't sound like himself, she, he said he was in an auto accident and the airbag um, hit his face, and that's why it happened. So she was another person who got scammed out of, um, it ended up being about $7,000 with the uh, iTunes cards. And a lot of people, the people, they don't even know what that iTunes card's about, but they're tell, told to go and get these. And so this was, again, one that the two-year period had expired. On an encouraging note, Mrs. Smith, who was, is a homebound beneficiary and lives in, in central Pennsylvania, called us to thank us to let us know that she received our scam wire alert in the morning, which was included in her home-delivered de meal package. That same afternoon, she received a phone call from a scammer and wanted us to know that she knew not to give out any personal information because of the alert. It's stories like these that keep us at it every day. 
Um, we have seen many similar cases. You'll see many more examples in my testimony, and I could even give you more. Uh, the need to prevent financial exploitation is a national imperative. We know that older adults and their families must talk about and plan for the possible incapacity as well. For those showing early signs of dementia, this is particularly important as they may eventually lose all capacity to make decisions. Uh, financial capacity is often the first to go. Um, we do try to work toward positive change. I'm my time's running out, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude here. Um, we are very pleased at the bipartisan attention to elder fraud that the committee is working on uh, and the Senior Safe Act, which builds on lessons learned from organizations like ours. Thank you again, and we're very pleased to work with you on this issue and are here for anything you need. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mr. Camus. You mentioned the direct referral from our committee's hotline to your office that resulted in the arrests of five suspects who uh, allegedly were responsible for almost $3 million in schemes that defrauded more than 1,200 victims. And this truly was an appalling case that we passed on to you. The senior citizen was so upset that he crashed his car on the way to the local Walmart to get the debit card. And he was convinced that he was going to be arrested immediately. So he leaves the scene of the crash and walks the rest of the way to Walmart. We were able to determine that the money was sent and picked up in Minnesota and provided your office with that information, and I really appreciate it that you acted on it. Could you please give us an update on that case since the arrest last May? Uh, yes, Senator, I sure, I'd be, I'd be proud to. We had one, one of the subjects has been uh, pled guilty, and he's been sentenced to, to two years in prison, and he's been ordered to pay $98,000 in restitution to multiple victims. The other defendants are, are going through the various stages of the legal system right now, but we we anticipate they too will be brought to justice here in the very near future. That's great news to hear. Ms. Griezmann, I'm also really pleased to hear the FTC has stepped up its efforts. And you mentioned the agreement or the settlement with Western Union uh, that have been made. And I am interested in whether or not that $586 million is going to end up compensating any of the victims. Were you able to trace the money uh, that had been lost, and will some of the victims be compensated? Thank you, Chairman. That is precisely the goal of the settlement. Uh, the Department of Justice, uh, pursuant to the two agreements, the two settlements, uh, will be the claims administrator. Uh, and it will, it will, they will take it upon and do their best job to try to reach out to victims and provide redress. That is so important because in the vast majority of these cases, once the money has been wired, it is gone forever. And it's very difficult to trace. And that's why I really appreciated uh, not only the settlement with Western Union that's going to lead to some restitution, but the quick work of the Inspector General's Office for Tax Administration that really stopped a fraud and in progress. And that's the kind of cooperation we need across government. One of the things that truly frustrates me about these con artists is that they're very clever and they are always changing their tactics to stay ahead of the consumer education efforts that we do and law enforcement. And I think we're all making a difference, but the fact is that the calls to our hotline doubled last year to more than 2,200. And I'm going to bring up a, a chart which demonstrates why scammers, it's a little hard to read, it's a little busy there, but uh, why they are continuously uh, changing their strategies. Let me explain it since it's uh, a, bit, a bit busy, as I said. Uh, between November 2014 and early 2016, the losses per month 
in the IRS impersonation scam averaged approximately a million dollars. It's a million dollars lost per month. However, starting in the spring of 2016, the losses per month increased to two to four million dollars. And I can see Mr. Camus uh, nodding his head in agreement. And it stayed at about that level through the end of last year. Um, and what happened during that time is the scammers made a change and they're no longer using the Walmart debit card as much. They've gone to the iTunes card, which struck me as very strange because I thought you used those to buy records, but uh, that perhaps uh, I'm out of it. Uh, but Mr. Camus, I'd like you to comment on whether the change in tactics plus the relentlessness that we've heard about from Mr. Hatch, where they call again and again and the next day with more demands, um, has that made scammers more successful in terms of the money they're bringing in, even if the number of victims has declined? Yes, we noted in, in April, Senator, that April 2016, that there was a shift to the iTunes card as a method of payment. They also redoubled their efforts on their auto dialer program. So they were able to make hundreds of thousands of telephone calls in a very short order. When the, when the scam, to your point exactly, when the scam first started, it was individuals calling one-on-one. -on -one. And then when they shifted to the auto dialer technology, they were able to blanket individuals with hundreds of thousands of calls leaving a callback number. About the same time, they shifted to the iTunes card, and, and what we learned in our investigation was the iTunes cards makes it very uh, easy for them to flip the money. They are no longer are paying middlemen to re convert payments into money orders. They're now selling the iTunes, card, iTunes cards on a third-party market and then pocketing the money immediately. And also, it's very difficult for law enforcement to trace that transaction. Thank you. Senator Casey. Thanks very much. <clears throat> um, Diane, I'm going to start with you, and not simply because you're a Pennsylvanian, but most especially because of your, your long work. I mentioned as well in my opening comments the, uh, the acronym, and I want to <laughs> put the words behind the acronym. Diane, you've worked for, we'll call it a couple years. Uh, yeah, for, yeah, just a few. <laughs> just a few. Um, I guess I can say decades. It's 28 years. 28. <laughs> for the uh, Center for Advocacy for the Rights and Interests of the Elderly, so-called CARI. So we're grateful for that work. Um, one question I had was, how do you coordinate in your work with both state authorities, federal authorities? Sometimes the most difficult challenge in any investigation is to the coordination. But how do you do that, and is there anything we should know about yeah. about those uh, issues. Yeah, it sure is challenging um, sometimes. But in Pennsylvania, we actually have a, a network of elder abuse task forces that operate in various counties across the, uh, across the state. Uh, in Philadelphia, our, our um, task force is specifically focused on financial exploitation. And so we have bankers and others at the table. Um, I, I think that's one of the best ways to coordinate is to actually know these people, to be able to sit around the table, talk about the problem. Sometimes we do case review. Views. So, you know, you get to talk about what, how this case got play, played out through the system, and it helps us. Uh, last year, um, you know, you, I know that the, the committee had a hearing about the uh, drug mules that were being used, and w one of the calls about that came into our, our office about a gentleman who was uh, from Pennsylvania and uh, jailed in Japan. And we were frustrated by that because we started calling everybody we could think of, and we found no help for that family. Um, but eventually, um, um, he did get out. Um, but, but when we were at our task force meeting, we talked about that case, and someone from Homeland Security was there, and we shared, they wanted, they gave us their card and said, can we share this information, you know, can you share the information um, about the family? And so we talked 
to the family and we were able to connect them with Homeland Security. So it's that kind of collaborative work, I think, that is very important because we, all, we have to know one another. Um, and reaching out to community groups that are in the community that actually work with older adults, working with law enforcement. I mean, we do this in our healthcare fraud program as well. It's very important that we, we can get to the OIG's office, that the FBI is involved, all these other groups so that we can get, get to the bottom of this. It's not always the same agency. Um, so, we're, so we try to work in collaboration as much as we can. I want to ask you as well about the, uh, you mentioned health care fraud. Mm -hmm. The um, so-called senior uh, Medicare patrol, I know you've worked very hard uh, with that, with that uh, patrol. Um, we, we're having a big debate here about the Affordable Care Act, and this is one area where there's a very strong set of numbers that, that aligns with the, uh, the progress that's been made over the last couple of years in combating uh, Medicare fraud. What, what's, if, to the extent that you can give an opinion on, on uh, what happens with regard to the ACA, uh, if it were to be repealed, say if it were repealed and not replaced, I know that that's uh, a big subject of debate, but just give us your sense of the impact uh, of the uh, Medicare fraud patrol. Well, there, there's a number of issues that I think that have, have impacted um, the health care fraud, um, you know, uncovering health care fraud, but also just um, Medicare and other provisions as well that we think are very important, looking at nursing homes and, and a n number of other issues. But one of the things the Affordable Care Act did, and it's sort of related to your last question, is it allowed, um, you know, depart agencies like CMS, Medicaid, Department of Veterans Affairs, Social Security Administration, and others to data share to help them identify criminals who are defrauding. Sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll get a call. We had a, a lady in Philadelphia who was a uh, podiatrist, uh, and she was, went into Chinatown. She was part of that community. And she started to basically getting people's Medicare numbers and billing. Turned out she was billing, like, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it actually was in the millions. Uh, and at one point she was vacationing in Paris when those when those um, bills were submitted. It's really important, you know, because we had a couple complaints from these beneficiaries, uh, and that's probably not going to rise to the level of a major investigation, but once you start looking at the data, you can see what's happening. And so that is extremely crit critical. So it's important to see because these, these criminals are, are going across programs. They're similar to the other scammers. They're setting up business where it's, oppor it's opportunistic business. The other thing that, um, that I... I, um, I think is important is that the, they created it, the Affordable Care Act created a Medicare fraud strike that costs about three hundred and fifty million dollars, and so far it's recovered more than ten billion dollars. So there's real good economic advantage to doing this work um, because when they do find these scammers, as I said, the lo a lot of them are very large scale. Um, the one I talked about was probably small compared to some of the large scale. I know in, in Florida, for instance, there were these um, groups, these uh, storefronts set up to, to basically pay Medicare beneficiaries for their Medicare numbers. And so it made these um, beneficiaries complicit in the fraud. Um, they, they certainly didn't understand what was happening. They were getting $10 or $20 or something like that, but they didn't understand what was going on. Um, so, we, so we really need to continue to do this work um, to um, to make sure that we're combating this stuff. And it just sometimes to us, when we're getting the complaints, and it seems all too easy, and sometimes the solution seems easy too. So we really need to make sure that we're looking at how we can make these systems work. And I think the more um, this, what was provided for in the Affordable Care Act has created some results, and we need to continue doing that. Well, I appreciate that. I'm out of time, but we'll come back. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Senator Rubio. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we, I'm, I want to continue to build on what you've just mentioned about the storefronts. And it's a topic that a lot of people aren't aware of. What we have in Florida, what we have in South Florida in particular today, is an outrageous crisis of Medicare fraud. And let me describe it. And I say this to you as a Cuban-American with both deep regret and sometimes shame about this reality. We have literally 50 to 100 individuals, mostly recent arrivals from Cuba, who arrive into the United States somehow figure out a way to set up a Medicare company. Usually it's a storefront, often just a P.O. box. They then acquire Medicare numbers from a runner, from somebody who works at a hospital, and they begin to bill those Medicare numbers for no services provided. 
Um, and I'm talking about to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars. I have been flat out told by law enforcement in Florida, and South Florida in particular, that if they don't get greedy and are just willing to steal two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a month, they're probably not going to get caught. Um, they are stealing on the tunes of millions of dollars. If you look at the list of the top most wanted Medicare fraudsters in America, they are almost entirely from South Florida and almost entirely recent arrivals from the island of Cuba. And when we are about to arrest them, if they know they're coming, they leave to Cuba with millions of dollars. It is an outrage. It is grotesque. It has been extensively covered by the press in South Florida. And people may think that seniors are not victims or just with the use. They are victims. Number one, it's helping to further exacerbate the financial troubles of Medicare. And in many cases, you're absolutely right. Seniors are being told, there's nothing wrong with this. It's legal. Just come in. All you got to do is sit down for an interview, give us your Medicare number. And before you know it, it's their account that's being billed for all this amount. And sometimes they get wrapped up in it. So I hope that we'll have a chance to focus on it. We had a chance to discuss it. When I tell people this, they don't believe it can. This is organized crime. In every other sense, it is an organized crime, and they are brazen about it, and they laugh about it because they know they can just leave and, and are protected uh, if they leave the country. My mother is a senior, and I, this is why I want to ask you this question. She has been the target in the past, and I just recalled this as we were having a conversation. Uh, she, after she suffered a stroke in 2011, is largely uh, home-ridden, except for she goes to therapy and so forth. She gets a call about uh, taxes she owes, and I know enough about my mom and her finances to know she hasn't made a lot of money ever, but certainly in the last couple of years, she's not been employed. She relies almost exclusively on Social Security and small savings. And uh, so we get this number and we try to, we didn't, try, even, even though I am in this position of public service, I, first of all, I didn't even know who to call about it at the time. Even, number two, it's a caller ID, so there's nothing I can do about it. But even if I had been able to lure them into an extensive conversation, I'm not sure if I should have gone to local government, the FBI, the, the, there was a little bit of confusion about who, who to take it to, that's number one. The second is her caregiver. She has people that come during the day and watch her a little bit, some, you know, some time to make sure she's taking her meds, are often the people answering it. So we have to figure out a way to educate them as well. And the third, quite frankly, especially in Florida for a lot of seniors, is a language barrier. My mother speaks English, but her first language was Spanish. That's where she watches the soap operas every night, that, uh, which I don't fully understand these soap operas and why they're so popular, but she watches them and uh, on, on the Spanish language networks. And a lot of the people that are being targeted for this are also being targeted because of the language barrier. So I guess in all of that is embedded the following questions. What can we do to improve the awareness of caregivers who might be the people answering the phones when these calls are coming? Um, what can we do to facilitate for them exactly to know who to, like, do we recommend that they actually talk to these people, engage them, and try to play detective? Or do we just tell them hang up and don't deal with them? And the third is, what can we do or should we do to ensure that communities, particularly enclaves of seniors that perhaps are getting the majority of their news and information in a second language like Spanish, that we're doing enough to inform them about these scams uh, and, and these things that are occurring? Yeah, I, I think that the public education is critical. I do think that another issue you might be interested in the future is looking at why people become subject to scams. Um, and, you know, we talk about people with dementia, but there's also an issue around financial capacity for at which someone may be able to function very, very well in their in their life. But their, their ability to manage finances goes down. And we're talk, one of the reasons older adults are, are targeted so often is because they're the ones who, who are at home and answer the phone. Uh, and they might be lonely. And these guys, not only do they come up with the latest, best scams, but they also know how to engage people and become their friends. So it's very challenging. I, I say that because it's very challenging um, even when we're doing the education to get people to pull back from this. Um, when you talk about the caregivers, um, the caregivers certainly should be educated about this as well um, because they're, they're on the front lines and they will see this happening. Um, I, I will, though, caution that sometimes we do see caregivers being the exploiters as well. So it's really important for families to be vigil vigilant about this. Uh, we certainly also deal with people with limited English as well. Um, I mean, one time we did a, um, a presentation in Chinatown, and I think it was simultaneously um, uh, 
translated into about eight different languages uh, so that people could get that information. So we try to do as much as we can to reach people uh, and to also train gatekeepers in those communities so that they're, you know, if, if it is um, a uh, Spanish-speaking community, we can train people in that community to take that message to individuals, those people who are going into the home, for instance, who are working in, in the uh, housing sites. We have housing uh, coordinators who are working with people individually. So that's where... And We've had scam. We had a scam by the uh, somebody telling them they were the cable company, and happened in housing, um, senior housing throughout the city, and so we were able through that. And one of them was at a, a, a housing site where most of the people spoke, speak Spanish, and that's where we actually f were able to tackle the problem because they got it. And I know I'm out of town. Just a suggestion that we would may we may want to talk to the two primary Spanish language networks about mm -hmm. public service announcements. They have that as part of their FCC license, and I think it would be really useful, especially mm -hmm. for the programming that is geared yeah. towards older audience. And we have been able to get those on our Spanish, our local Spanish oh, language good. stations. Thank you very much, Senator Rubio. As you were talking, I was thinking that we should get this postcard uh, translated into Spanish as well, so that you want me to do it? I'll do it. I can translate. <laughs> <laughs> I even know how to do the accents on the. I have no doubt of that. But we'll that, no, we, we can we'll put call your you Susanna. picture as you want. <laughs> but, uh, and I love the idea of including it with Meals on Wheels, because that would reach a lot of homebound seniors. Mm -hmm. So that's something we can look at also. Uh, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, and thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. This is such a vital hearing, and it's, you know, I've traveled around New York State asking community centers and senior centers, you know, have you been affected? And overwhelmingly, almost every hand in the room is raised because someone has gotten the IRS scam, someone has gotten the uh, grandparent scam, somebody has gotten the uh, sweepstakes scam. And it's heartbreaking. And m some of these seniors have lost tens of thousands of dollars. And there's no protection for them. So I, I, have, I have three sets of questions. First, um, what should we do as the Senate uh, committee to, all of you have said, yes, there must be public education. How must there be public education? What legislation should we write about how to educate all seniors about these scams? Specifically, how do we reach all seniors in this country? N number two, every one of these scams has public uh, participation on some level. The CVS counter that sells the iTunes card, the Target that sends the, sells the iTunes card, the uh, credit union, the bank, the, thank goodness one New York woman, she went to her bank to take out $5,000 to pay the IRS uh, scam and someone's sitting outside waiting for her to bring the money. And the teller so smartly says, ma'am, you look so nervous. Are you okay? And she's like, no, I've got the IRS on the phone and I have to give them the money right now. The woman was smart enough to say, give me the phone, hung it up, said that the IRS will never call you. Should we not be, be having conversations directly with any place you can purchase an iTunes card? Shouldn't there be a, a notice that's on every cash register? If someone buys an iTunes card, please confirm it's to purchase an iTunes card for music that it's, or for a video game. It's not to give to the IRS. Like, why aren't we posting at every vendor that sells iTunes? Every bank, every teller should be trained on this. I don't think we're doing enough to prevent these horrible crimes from happening. And all of you said these are significant criminal networks. I've heard some are run by the Russian mob, for God's sakes. Like, if we knew massive criminal networks were targeting our seniors, our families, I would think we'd be doing much more than we're doing. But for some reason, we are not taking this as seriously as, as we should do. These are, oh, these seniors are being duped, the money's gone. Well, if we had some huge mob cartel you know, bringing drugs into this country, we'd have federal action. We'd be sending money to address it. And I don't feel like we're doing that. And this, the, 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 the degree of the scam is much bigger than we've even disclosed. We only have what's been reported, but we know 40% isn't even reported because it's so embarrassing. This happened to my aunt. She got the IRS scam. She sent the money. She never told my mother who does all her finances. She was so embarrassed. So we're not even getting the full report. So from each of you, I would like to know what you recommend to us to prevent this from warning 
uh, various parties that are involved in these scams unwittingly, the people who sell the iTunes cards, the banks. I have a senior who went to her bank and took out a advance. And you know what the bank's doing to her now? Charging her interest because she can't pay the money back because it's gone. And no relief from her bank. So this is a problem. So from each of you, direct recommendations for us. Thank you so much, Senator. You're, you're right on target with what we're trying to do. Um, we agree that once the money is gone, it's gone, as the Senator pointed out. Public education is the number one way to combat this. Criminals will continue to go for the vulnerable, in this case senior citizens, as long as they get money. Specifically, what kind of public education and in what form? Right. We send our special agents out, and we look forward to invites for town hall meetings, especially at senior centers, and we've had very good feedback on those. So we think we can penetrate into uh, that, that segment by actually participating with members of Congress at various town hall events, and we would be proud to have a special agent come and speak to this very issue. So that's just one idea I would have. Uh, as far as the vendors, right now we're working on a project with, with Walmart to do exactly as you described, that is post placards and train their, train their cashiers that when somebody comes through with a handful of iTunes cards, that there's some sort of a dialogue that goes on prior to that purchase being consummated. There's a scam going on. Are you aware of the scam? Have you been told that these iTunes cards are for taxes? If you have, it's a scam. We've been successful with MoneyGram, for example, that when individuals go onto the MoneyGram kiosk in a CVS, one of the warnings that pops up early in the transaction is, if you've been told to pay your taxes with a MoneyGram, you're being scammed, please stop the transaction. So we totally agree with you that we have to leverage the retailers and get them to, to cooperate, and in some cases we have. A recent shift that we've seen is uh, primarily Walmart was being used as the retailer, and now our data is telling us within just this past month that it's now being shifted to Target. So just yesterday I had one of my executives reach out to Target, and we're going to insist that Target work with us the same way Walmart did. But for us as a small agency, a small law enforcement agency, we think that every person that we protect is a victory. That's how we view this. It's not just the law enforcement aspect. It's every single person that doesn't become a victim is a victory. But how do we collectively, to your point, how do we collectively come together and make a bigger impact? So certainly working with the FTC is something that we've really enjoyed doing. But there's still more that can be done. But I, I just want to give you the assurance that we're doing a lot behind the scenes. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to address the points you raise. It's very serious, and I, and I, I don't want to under have you think in any way that this is not a top priority for the Federal Trade Commission. In terms of prevention, I would urge each of you, if you don't already use our Pass It On materials, put them up again. Uh, these are tested. This is, we think, a very effective way to reach seniors where they are and to provide them with the tools they need so that they are the ones positioned to assist friends and family members not to be victimized. There's a specific piece on, on IRS imposter scams. The intermediaries. There are two things we do. One, we sue them. That's what the settlement with Western Union is about. We had a settlement years before with MoneyGram through amendments to the telemarketing sales rule. We made illegal wire transfers in connection with telemarketing, and we also prohibited other types of um, um, reloadable cards being used. So law enforcement is, is front and center in terms of the intermediaries. We also, as, as Deputy Inspector Camus referred, we have lots of conversations with Apple, with Walmart, with um, a trade association for relevant industry members. The Western Union settlement, like the MoneyGram, uh, imposes specific requirements to make it more likely that the company will intercept uh, and prevent the transfer of money, because as we've all discussed, once it's gone, it's gone. And that's exactly why the scammers are using those types of uh, payment instruments. So the, that's, um, that's where we are. We will continue to work with industry members to get better signage, to get other um, analytical tools in place so that they can identify where the bad actors are and how the transfers are going forward. Thank you. I, um, I can't agree more with what you said, but I, I, I do want to put a, a plug in for the Senior Safe Act. 
uh, which is one thing that you can do. Uh, and this is one of the biggest problems we've had with financial in institutions is making these reports. Um, in my written testimony, you'll see a story about a lady who was bilked out of $800,000. That was basically everything she had. Uh, she was in her 80s, and she thought she was winning the lottery. And so she kept paying money and didn't tell her family until it was way too late. And I think it was finally that she had her, she and her husband had invested their money with an investment firm for their, you know, all their adult life. And her husband had died and that was their money in the bank. And no one made a report. And eventually the money got transferred to another bank and she continued to buy these Walmart cards and everything to get, to pay this thing. And finally that second bank made a report, but that was after $800,000 was lost. So we need to do something to make them feel better. I mean, you know, we, we keep pulling out the Graham Leach Bliley Act and saying, you can do this, uh, you're covered. Um, but they still are not doing it. And sometimes I can tell you what happens in some of the cases that work out well is it's the teller who's making the report. They're not necessarily authorized by the guys at the top, but it's the teller who's coming in and they're seeing all these deposits withdrawals taken. So that gets to your point of training the people who see it happening, the people who are who are at the tellers at the bank, the people although we have fewer and fewer of those these days, um, and the people who are um, at the uh, at the, the stores. The other thing is that we need to encourage age friendly um, uh, services in those institutions. We need to have fraud te technology. There's a lot of technology out there these days. I, I remember sitting in a meeting with the bankers and saying, well you know if I'm go if I, I'm out of town and you know I use my credit card like I, I was in um, somewhere in Chicago, I think, and suddenly my card got shut off. Well, you know, it was legitimate charges, but they shut off my card because they were monitoring it. I said, why can't you do that for some of these cases? And they're very shy about doing that. They won't do it. Um, and so, that, but those technologies really need to be used for this. They need to come into action. And the age-friendly services are also important to make sure that they have protections, like encouraging them to plan for incapacity, offering age-friendly account features, like having someone who has access to your account. Maybe they can't take money out, but the daughter, for instance, can get in and look up, monitor online to make sure nothing is going wrong. And so all of those kinds of things, I think, can be done. Um, I hope that we can do more to combat this, and we need to, you know, when you talk about education, I mean, sometimes it really is just as easy as putting up a sign at the at the um, cash register so the person managing that cash register sees somebody buying an older person, somebody who's 80, 82 years old, buying all these iTunes cards. That's a flag. Uh, I can't imagine why you wouldn't report that. So we need to put, we need to do exactly what you're saying. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Um, very excited to be a member of this committee. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of you uh, for what you do. Um, I was fortunate to be able to work with the FTC um, as the Attorney General of Nevada and uh, had great partnership. And many of you uh, we have worked with on so many different levels. This area was important for me as Attorney General. That's why I created a, a unit in my office to address elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Every single one of the scams that you identify here happens in Nevada. Uh, and we had some great partners. Uh, I want to talk on a couple of levels, though. The first one is the, the public education, because to me this is the first step in prevention, and it is so hard to do. It really is. Um, there are many of us that are trying to do our outreach and get out and talk to uh, folks, but it has to be on a constant basis. You can't just say, I'm throwing this out there, we'll do it overnight, and that's done. You, the education occurs all the time, all the time. Uh, I have been, I, I always say this, just about to every senior senator center in Nevada to reach out to our seniors. But it's not just reaching out to seniors. It's reaching out to their caregivers. It's reaching out to family. It's reaching out to service providers. So for my purposes, and this is what I'm going to ask with your help, uh, I had put on conferences in the state of Nevada just bringing people in for the training, for the public education, bringing the experts in to talk about it, how we educate, how we train, uh, and how we constantly get that information out. That's one thing that I would love your help with in Nevada to continue down that road. Um, the next one, however, um, is uh, challenging for me uh, when it comes to law enforcement. And this is a question I have um, for our law enforcement folks. Giving the aging population, in Nevada it is growing, um, but also we are constantly evolving with technology and technological scams. Um, 
What additional resources or innovations does law enforcement need to keep up with the financial threats posed to seniors now? And, and when you talk about it, talk also about uh, how we examine uh, also the money transfer systems, which make it much easier for some of these criminal elements to engage and scam our seniors. Well, just a couple ideas. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and we do look forward to working with you in Nevada. One of the ideas you could come up with would be uh, there's a 72-hour right of rescission on large transactions. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, it could be considered that on any wire transaction, instead of it being rapid and instantaneous, there's some sort of a, a 72 hour right of rescission because many of the victims that we spoke to, they realized it, but just a little bit too late. By the time they realized or talked to a family member about being scammed, the money was already gone and there's no, no way to get right. it back. But if we could get that frozen for just a period of time to allow a recognition, a family discussion or law enforcement to intercede, we might be able to save people a lot of money and save their lives, actually. But as far as the, um, some of the other ideas, um, the challenge for law enforcement is the money moves so quickly and the ability to convince somebody to put their federal income tax payment on an iTunes card, that, that is really difficult. As I said in my testimony, we estimate that just through media on our own as a small agency, we believe that we, we had 113 million views over 100 media interviews, and it's constant with us. Uh, we had Apple agree to fund a pilot program where over the air in a CVS stores and, and other drug stores, the, the message over the air as they were shopping were do not use Apple iTunes cards to pay public debt. Do not use Apple iTunes cards to pay government. That doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And we think that that worked, but it's very, very expensive. That, that project cost Apple, I believe, $140,000 to fund that, but it was a pilot. So if we could get more of that type of cooperation, a fund set up where uh, some of these retailers and companies are required to put, to put aside some money to help educate and continuously educate, because it's so difficult to penetrate. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a journalism major, but I, I am astounded by how difficult it is. And, how, and I take calls myself at my desk. And, and just this morning, I took a call from a victim, and they had no idea that there was any, any such thing as an impersonation scam. And, and it perplexes me. I'm like, what more, what more could we all do? What are other things that we can do to try to reach that? Yeah, and that's why it's constant. The education has to be constant because uh, it, it, people are not really listening. Uh, and let me just say one thing as well, and, and I found this in, in Nevada. Part of it, too, is uh, when they become victims, and we've heard it here, but they are embarrassed to come forward. They are embarrassed to say that this happened to them, and we have to give them a venue to be able to say it did happen, it's all right, it's happening uh, across this country, uh, to make sure that they're willing to come out and educate themselves and educate others uh, about this type of scam. Thank you, Senator, and, and we've enjoyed the cooperative relationship with your former office as well. Um, you mentioned how do we get out into the community? Well, we've held uh, some 33 common ground conferences throughout the country. One was in Vegas mm -hmm. with the help of your former office. Uh, there we're working with grassroots members, people from the Chamber of Commerce, legal service providers, obviously mm -hmm. the Attorney General's office, local law enforcement. Uh, and the discussions vary nationwide. Uh, but a lot of focus is on, on issues affecting seniors in the community. And we learn from those conferences. We push out our consumer education materials. We, we will continue to do more on that front. Money transfer ser services, well, I'd like to sit here and be cautiously optimistic that the near half billion dollar settlement with Western Union will squeeze some of the fraud out of that system. Uh, and, and I think it will. It's an order with very rigorous requirements that if they adhere to them uh, should make a difference. Of course, we're squeezing money out of that system, then it's just going to find another uh, path of, of less resistance to move to. There's no silver bullet in this. Uh, education has to complement law enforcement, and that's what we're committed to doing. Uh, we certainly look forward to working with each and every one of you to, to build upon what we've been doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And let me just uh, uh, add one final thing. Uh, Diane, the Senior Medicare Patrol Unit was in my office. It is instrumental. Uh, I will always continue to support it. I can't tell you how many seniors not only were excited to be a part of it, but we were able to uncover fraud. And uh, I can't say enough about the, the, the journals, the diaries, the healthcare diaries and journals that we would hand out to individuals. Um, it, it matters. They really pay attention when you talk about it. And when you have their peers talking to them 
uh, about how we address Medicare fraud and Medicaid fraud, which we handled in my office, uh, it, it, it made a difference. So I will continue to support programs and advocacy. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Plague. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And sorry if I'm plowing old ground here. Um, but uh, can you tell me what innovative programs are already out there that the states have come up with um, for uh, addressing these senior scams? Anybody who wants to start there? As far as the states are concerned? Yes. Um, and we work with multiple states and we work with law enforcement agencies, local and other federal partners. And I'm not uniquely aware that, that any of the states that we're working in have come up with innovative approaches, but I'm probably not the one that's best um, All right. suited to answer that. Uh, many states have wonderful, robust programs uh, addressing fraud targeting seniors. Uh, many have discrete offices uh, <coughs> that, that directly focus on that. Uh, and to the extent possible, we work closely with them. We, I'd mentioned earlier, our pass it on materials. We freely distribute those to the states. We urge everyone to, to put their own name on it. We have no uh, copyright interest in it. We just want to pass on those materials so that they can be used. Okay. And um, can I just add that um, one of the tools we have at the state level is the Older Adult Protective Services uh, Office, which often gets the first report on these cases. And I just want to say that one of our recommendations is to make sure that those programs are strong enough to do what they need to do. Um, one of the things that they often lack is forensic accountants, for instance, to be able to actually take on a case and figure out what's happening. So we need more resources in that program. And at the same time, we're aware that the Social Services Block Grant uh, funding is 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 under you know is is under question at this point and that's the money that often supports those programs at the state level so we need to you know while we need to enhance the funding for those programs we need to at least um, maintain the funding for those programs because they're often the first line um, when senator rubio asked who to report to my I, I didn't answer his question but what i meant to say was just report it it doesn't really matter because when you report it to one place it'll get to the right place eventually and that's what protective services does is it's a first line, uh, and it, it's very helpful uh, to be able to get that person into the system. So, well, thank you, Ms. Menio. You mentioned in your testimony that a beneficiary called to thank you for the timely uh, scam wire alert she uh, received at her in her home, and, and they delivered a package shortly thereafter. Um, are there any reoccurring services uh, that seniors use when? Companies, which com where companies can include these fraud alerts, uh, so that they can uh, be delivered more. Yes, um, we also we also distribute those to public libraries, senior centers, ho senior housing. Uh, we distribute them to a large number of places where we know people grocery stores, places where people uh, gather, uh, where older people uh, do business, and the the, the home delivered meals. Um, uh, project that we do is really focused on people that we won't reach right. by going to the library or, or senior center or at those kinds of places. It's the people who are homebound and don't get out and wouldn't get that message otherwise. But we are trying to do that through many different public venues. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Flake. Uh, before you were here, Ms. Menio mentioned uh, the Senior Safe Act, which you were a co-sponsor of in the last Congress and which uh, we've reintroduced. Senator Casey is a co-sponsor. And just yesterday, AARP has endorsed that bill, along with we have endorsements from Legal Services for the Elderly, the National American Securities Administrators Association, the Conference on State Bank, supervisors, uh, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and a wide variety of regulatory groups. And that is one concrete action we could take in this Congress that would really make a difference in empowering those frontline tellers that our witnesses were describing and uh, who can make a real difference in stopping fraud right up front. So I'm going to ask unanimous consent that all of those endorsement letters be entered into the record. Senator Warren. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for holding this hearing, you and the ranking member. And I want to just follow up. I think your point about how better to empower people on the front lines is really important. I just want to look at another aspect of that. As we know, the con artists who perpetuate IRS impersonation scams, identity theft, and other forms of financial exploitation often target seniors. And when a senior needs to report that they were the victim of fraud, it is frequently the men and women who work in our government enforcement and consumer protection agencies in Washington and in all 50 states who are on the front lines taking their calls and investigating their cases. So it seems pretty obvious to me that one easy way to protect America's seniors from, from fraud is to strengthen that workforce. But instead of staffing up the workforce that cracks down on scammers and fraudsters that hurt our seniors, on his first full day in the Oval Office, President Trump issued an executive order freezing federal hiring and starving our enforcement agencies of their most important resource, American workers. So, Mr. Camus, you are Deputy Inspector General for the Investigations at the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. Your job is to protect seniors against scammers who pretend that the IRS is calling uh, and trying to collect back taxes. Almost two million people have reported this scam to your office, and these scams have cost Americans more than $54 million. It's a lot of money. Does a hiring freeze help you achieve your goal of protecting seniors from fraud? Uh, as, you, as you point out, Senator, these are, it's a huge issue, and, it, and every one of these victims is a significant um, challenge on our resources. So naturally, I've been told I'm not allowed to pander for resources at these okay. events. But we'll I let you know you. If, you've, if you've crossed the line into, into pandering here. I can tell you I'm very proud and we're a very efficient agency, but um, certainly this, this has stretched our agency very thin. We are seeking the exemption in the president's order to, um, to under a public safety clause, for, at least for the special agent portion of our workforce. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Camus. You know, according to testimony from your office, uh, back in 2016, quote, reduced staffing has affected the IRS's ability to deliver its priority program areas, including customer service and enforcement. Given that your enforcement team is already understaffed, I worry that this kind of hiring freeze is music to criminals' ears. Now, Mr. Camus, you also work with the Department of Justice to help protect seniors from criminals who are trying to defraud them. Will the hiring freeze help you with the DOJ? Again, you know, it's, um, we're only limited, all of us are only limited by uh, how much resource we have, and we're all very passionate about protecting all Americans, but most especially our most vulnerable. That's why I took the oath to be a law enforcement officer. It's, so it's a challenge. Resources are a challenge on a good day. So any disruption in that is, is certainly a cause for concern. I'm not sure whether the Internal Revenue Service or the Department of Justice have any exemptions available to them under the order. Right. But if they don't? I, I could not comment. I don't, right. I don't know right. the impact. You know, I, I just want to point out, we have seen this movie before. A 2011 hiring freeze at the Social Security Administration eliminated 15% of the agency's workforce and closed 64 field offices. Ms. Menio, you are the executive director at the Center for Advocacy for the Rights and Interests of the Elderly in Philadelphia. Can you explain how the 2011 Social Security personnel freeze affected the seniors that your center works with every day? Well, certainly it, 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 it takes a lot longer to make an appointment. So increased um, wait times. I can um, tell you that we're, you know, interestingly, the Social Security, I'm in downtown Philadelphia, and the Social Security office is in our building. They have the top floor. And uh, the way that it's, it, it works is no one goes upstairs until the guard lets them go upstairs. So they get the message, you can send more people up. And that line gets quite long. 
and people are standing there with their walkers and their canes and waiting to go upstairs. And so that's something I see every day. Um, I can also tell you that my staff spends a lot of time when they're helping consumers doing three-way calls because we're not, you know, we, we like to empower people and work with them, but sometimes it's difficult for them to make that call on their own. So we'll sit with them, and, it, and they tell me it's 30, 30 minutes to an hour sometimes they're waiting for that call to get through. <laughs> we had a client who called us recently from the western part of the state who um, her husband died and she was collecting she wanted to switch her social security so she could collect on his account I believe something like that and what happened was the and the, you know I think this is illustrative of the short staffing is she got lost in the system she lo didn't get a check at all for three months and that meant her Medicare Part D wasn't be B wasn't being paid and so she didn't even have her health care during that time eventually we were able to help her get that back but nevertheless it was a very stressful time for her it shouldn't have happened that way it probably took more man hours from the Social Security office to fix this than it would have taken to help her in the first place. So those are the, some of the kinds of things we're seeing. I also know that the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities put out a report and they said that um, less than 1% of their operating, ex uh, of their expenses are spent on uh, overhead. Uh, I can't run my agency on less than one. I wish I could, to be honest with you, but I can't. Mm -hmm. And so that just isn't realistic. How can you continue to provide the level of services to this aging population, um, to many of us who, who are ready to you know, go into the Social Security system, into Medicare? We need to be able to get that information as quickly as we can and work with people without going through a lot of red tape and spending hours on the mm -hmm. phone and in, in offices. And I appreciate that. You know, I just want to add a couple of statistics if I can, and then I'll quit. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> You know, appeals time also go up. It's, she's talking about helping people apply. But the appeals time go up. Almost 20,000 people died waiting for a disability eligibility decision in FY 2016. You know, with all of these negative consequences, you would at least hope that these freezes save money. But what the data actually show is that they don't save money, that we have a workforce that is just more stressed, more inefficient. You spend more time trying to fix the problems that are broken because you didn't solve it early on. I just want to say I appreciate the work you're doing, and I hope that we can give you better support to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you all for coming before the committee and, and uh, at least in one case, returning uh, to the committee. Uh, I, I've got a, a more general question here. You know, we're, th this committee is intended to provide insights into uh, the seniors abuse, caregiver uh, programs, those sorts of things over the course of the last two years that I was on it. Um, and then we've had some discussions about legislative proposals uh, here at the federal level, and we've talked about potential best practices down in the uh, states. Uh, but it, it doesn't seem to me we've made much progress. Um, so could you give me, uh, and any of your opinions uh, and, and the capacity before this committee of examples of where I should uh, be kinder uh, in my assessment? And what kind of progress are we making at the state or federal level that you think is really uh, moving the ball substantially in the right direction? And uh, Mr. Camus, we want to start with you. Uh, it's. Um one of the biggest challenges I have, Senator, is, and, I, and I've been working with staff here, is as we investigate crimes, we learn. We learn how they're doing it. We learn how they're shifting. And as, as Senator Collins pointed out, the criminals are watching every single thing that we do from all over the world. And then they're adapting to what we do. It's literally a cat and mouse game. And they will continue to victimize our most vulnerable citizens because they can get money. So... Any ideas that, that uh, we have, we're happy to meet with staff and talk about, this is how the crime happened. So legislatively, what are some of the areas that could be explored? One of the things we're excited about is in our investigation um, through the FTC's uh, help, we started working with the Federal Communications Commission. And what we learned was they have task forces under the U.S. Telecom Consortium that are actually working on technology to block robocalls that are coming in spoofed. And in one pilot in the IRS... Not upper, political ones, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the robocall area, in, in a pilot, they were able to block about 2 million spoofed calls that were coming in that could have hit the seniors. 
how many people would have been victimized by those calls? Mm -hmm. And then the other area that we're excited about the technology is the, um, there's a traceback task force as well. And what that will allow us to do as law enforcement is be able to figure out when the bad guys are calling in from offshore, quickly determine where that call came from, mm -hmm. and then work with partners offshore to try to get them uh, eliminated or taken out of service. It's a matter of how, how do we get to a point where we're scaling some of those things, you know, how, to, to where we're, we're going from kind of a good proof of concept to a, a pervasive capability that clearly something like that could have a significant uh, effect on a lot of the, the nets that are being cast and then capturing seniors in and taking advantage of them. So I think that's uh, more of a quote. We'll go down and just get an assessment for why I should feel better about things that we can scale. But uh, give me uh, your read down the panel. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate the opportunity to be here again. Uh, aggressive continued law enforcement is ongoing, and it is, it, it is making a dent. It may not be a sustained dent, but you've got it, that's not a reason not to do it. Uh, I'll point again to the recent Western Union settlement, $586 million, with significant injunctive relief requiring the company to change how it does business uh, in terms of fraud pretend prevention. The recent crackdown by DOJ with TIGTA on um, entities in the U.S. and in India targeting U.S. consumers with the IRS imposter scam, those make a difference. We need to figure out how to sustain them and implement them uh, on, on, on a more permanent basis. Uh, uh, Mr. Camus just referred to some of the work going on with robocalls. We've been at this for years. And what has happened as a result of it is that new technologies have been developed. They are in the marketplace. One of the uh, first ones was the result of an FTC challenge back, I think, in 2012. These are call blocking technologies that work. And then there's a great more cooperation and coordination among industry and government to, to bring these technologies to the forefront and also to develop, though it's not going to happen overnight, caller ID authentication. That will provide a significant tool, technological change, that will prevent some of these calls from hitting consumers. So I, I, I think there's good reason to be optimistic. Well, I wish I had some of their answers for you, but um, we're not on that scale. But I think on a, on a very large scale, in a sense, our, our senior Medicare patrol is a good example of this work. And it's, it's, a st it's in every state in this country. And I can tell you right now we're working, um, we, we had some consumers, some beneficiaries call us about something that we think is a scam. Not totally, a, we're not sure yet and I'm not gonna say what it is because it's being investigated right now. But what we were able to do is get in, on the phone with people from your state and from, um, I believe, I think, I th I'm not sure if it's Maine or not, but it's one of the New England states, a number of states that, with our colleagues who are doing the same work we're doing. And we were finding out that the same scam is, ha or the same situation is happening in each of those places, which made it a lot easier for us to go to the inspector general with this. And so it's being investigated now. We think it might be a very large scale uh, is issue. That's the way, but again, it gets back to that working in collaboration with other people is so important because we get two calls, we'll say, well, maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not. It sounded fishy, so we definitely wanted to look into it further, but with those two calls, nothing was going to happen when we called the OIG, but once we get those our colleagues from other states identifying these problems as well, then that makes a case. And I think something can happen to protect people in the future through that situation. So, well, thank you. And, and uh, you know, Madam Chair, I know that uh, the chair has, has put together great proposals for programs that have worked their way through uh, Congress and, and authorizing maybe additional initiatives that will be helpful. But it really also points to why we've got to get to a regular order appropriations process so that we then have the, the financial resources behind these programs to scale them and get them implemented. And so that we can come back and start measuring uh, what I think are the results that can come about. A lot of great ideas, a lot of great pilots, a lot of great proofs of concept, a lot of great law enforcement uh, actions that we just got to scale. And, uh, and then we also, if I had more time, I'm way over now, uh, at the end of the day, uh, most of what we're talking about here are the, uh, the cure. Uh, we got to work on the prevention side, which means that we have to continue to focus on education, destigmatizing public acknowledgement that you've been abused, and doing those kinds of things so that you very early, early in the cycle of abuse, uh, you, you prevent it from ever happening. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Senator. I certainly agreed with your comments about the appropriations process. I would indicate that compared to the very first hearing that we held on scams, we have come a long, long ways. And uh, law enforcement has stepped up to the plate, has started aggregating these scams rather than dismissing them because they're only $2,000 here or $3,000 here. And when GAO came out with $2.9 billion annually, I really think it helped, and our hearings helped uh, raise the awareness of the public and the need for aggressive enforcement the cases that were described earlier today. So I'm actually encouraged that we're making progress, but these criminals are relentless and will continue. Me too, Madam Chair. I'm just mad at the people that do this, and I want them to, to suffer badly as a result of it <laughs> as quickly as possible. Well, there's nothing like putting people in jail to be a good deterrent, that's for sure. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for having this hearing and your very, very persistent drive to increase the effectiveness of our laws and the enforcement of them. And like my colleague from Nevada, I was State Attorney General for some years, back 20 years, and we established a unit quite a while ago to focus on elder abuse and criminal activity that victimizes them. And I agree as well that education is among the best Preventive steps, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Recovering money after the fact is very difficult, but it is possible. And educating the bad guys is important, at least as important as educating the good guys, because educating them through deterrence, the chair is absolutely right that prison time teaches a very valuable lesson. So uh, with that in mind, I introduced a bill called uh, the Robert Montava uh, Criminal uh, uh, Victim Pre Abuse Prevention and, and uh, Restitution Act. It became, with bipartisan support, the Elder Abuse Prevention and Prosecution Act, uh, which was approved by the Judiciary Committee. Uh, in fact, it's bipartisan. Senator Grassley and I together led it. And it would improve the current law in a number of ways. It's now out of committee. It's on the House floor. We can approve it if we get bipartisan support there. And if our distinguished leadership there puts it on the floor, I'm sure it will be approved near unanimously. Uh, it would expand data collection and information sharing to better prevent and respond to elder abuse and exploitation. It would increase training, improve information sharing among agencies, and it would increase penalties for perpetrators of these crimes. So the anger that my colleagues feel could be channeled very positively and effectively against those bad guys by passing this measure, including mandatory forfeiture to deter future offenses. Everybody here knows that what drives these crimes is money. If you require mandatory forfeiture, it hits them where they live. And uh, mandatory forfeiture, in fact, will enable more restitution so that we prevent by deterring, but we also make people whole, or at least work to make them whole. So uh, to any of you who would like to answer, do you believe that mandatory Forfeiture, restitution, and increased penalties for perpetrators will be effective in deterring future criminal activity. That's the softest ball that anybody <laughs> has thrown to you in quite a while. As a career law enforcement man, yes. Um, we, we work really hard and we dedicate resources to investigate these. And there's nothing like at the end of the day when my agents can go to court and the perpetrator especially picking on our vulnerable citizens gets a significant sentence. So the more that we could punish them and the more that we can rapidly recover any monies that are available, in many cases there, there may or may not be assets available, the better for us. So we, we wholeheartedly agree with uh, increased um, deterrence through increased penalties. 
a senator, it's a delightful softball. Um, I, we're a civil law enforcement agency, so I, I, I cannot speak to it. I have to defer to my criminal colleagues. I will say, though, that anything that ramps up deterrence uh, and, and helps us on the civil side would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. And I'd just like to add that I think one of the reasons that elderly are targeted is that oftentimes they, the, the, the perpetrators feel that they're not going to, and I'm talking more about that homespun uh, type of financial exploitation that happens. They just think they're going to get away with it, because they do. And so one of the things we're, we're advocating for in Pennsylvania is enhanced sentencing for people uh, who commit crimes against the elderly. Um, and so I think it, it's very, very important, because the other issue that we have often with crimes against the elderly is that if someone does have dementia, oftentimes we're finding that the, the police aren't arresting, um, because that person isn't a good witness in court. They're not a, not a good reporter. So we've got to get past that as well. Um, and I can tell you of some horrendous crimes that have been committed against people who, without capacity. And if, if we've got to come up with a system to make sure that there's a reason for people not to do this, that they're going to be a little afraid of, of, of taking advantage of the elderly. So thank you for that. Thank you all for your support and thank you for your great work. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all of our witnesses today for your very important contributions, whether it's law enforcement or education or civil actions against uh, those who would rip up some of the most vulnerable citizens in our country, our nation's seniors. As we've heard today and as our committee's uh, new fraud book makes clear, criminals are relentless in their pursuit to swindle seniors out of their hard-earned savings. We see infinite varieties of these scams. Once one is closed down, another pops up. Uh, it, I, too, have had those phone calls on my home answering machine in Bangor, Maine, and I called the IG's office up immediately because I was so excited. I thought I could help entrap uh, one of these criminals, and it turned out that the numbers expire after three days, uh, so that by the time I got home for the weekend, uh, the numbers were no good. So I was so crushed because I thought I could help bring these people to justice, which is exactly what is the commitment of each and every one of us here. While much remains to be done, I'm proud that this committee has been just as relentless as the criminals in fighting back against this fraud. And the important work that all of you are doing really it contributes to our efforts. I look forward to continuing to work with our ranking members and with our returning and new members of the committee as we continue this fight in the new Congress. Uh, committee members will have until Friday, February 24th to submit questions for the record. As a reminder, at the risk of sounding like one of those late night infomercials, the committee's toll-free fraud number is 1-855-303-9470. 1-855-303-9470. And the reason I mention that is those 2,300 calls that we got last year enabled us to identify new scams so that we could warn people and come up with tips for avoiding uh, people becoming victims. So we've distributed so many copies of our fraud book and our, our postcard, and we're going to continue those educational and prevention efforts as well. I would call on our ranking member if you have any concluding remarks that you would like to make, Senator Casey. Thank you, Madam Chair. one 855 Thank you for that message. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes our hearing. It is now adjourned. <laughs>